Welcome to Probability Theory. Some may call it Mathematical Statistics 1. This is an introductory video, and my name is Mark Ledbetter. So welcome. In this lecture, we're going to introduce the study of statistics, outline the semester, what we're going to cover, just the basic chapters, which are the first five, and start in on the basic vocabulary for probability. What is statistics? Well, I could give you the boring definition. You're welcome to read it. Please also write it down on your lecture um, notes that you're going to scan in uh, for this video. Or I could talk about what excites me and give you an example. So in statistics, it's being able to discover something about a large population by only taking a relatively small sample from that population. We don't have to really know anything about the underlying laws or equations that govern that situation, and we can still use that sample to very well understand that population. So to me, that is not only exciting, but very powerful. That's why I love statistics. So let's talk about the people in Virginia that have contracted COVID-19, and we're going to call that the population over here, the big uh, circle or oval on the left. And then we're going to take a sample, which is over on the right, that is representative of that population. There's a whole course on sample theory. We won't discuss that, but um, there are ways to make sure that our sample represents our population well, so that what we learn really is about the population. And so what we do is we analyze that sample, and by analyzing it, we understand that population with some level of uncertainty. And that's the catch with statistics. We're never 100%. However, we can control this uncertainty. So we can make our certainty at 99.9% .9 and our uncertainty at 0.1%. And we can do that very easily in some situations, in many, actually. Okay. Before we run, we need to walk. So statistics is a very broad term. So I've listed out some of the areas of expertise within statistics, within the field of statistics. So probability is a very uh, deep and mathematical uh, area of statistics. The basic concepts of probability are also the foundation upon which statistics is built. So you see sampling theory, estimation, inference, decision theory. Now estimation and inference are an extension of decision theory. Game theory is an extension of decision theory. We have classification, prediction, modeling, many others, and most of these overlap in some way. And in fact, um, all of these require probability because it's the foundation as you will. All right, so in order to do statistics, we have to understand probability or we won't do it well. This first semester, we're going to study basic probability theory, although you may not always feel that it's basic. We then move to statistics uh, in the second semester. Specifically, we're going to do estimation and inference, and we're going to do that on a fairly involved level so that you will be um, very well versed so that when you apply statistics you'll know what you're doing and why you're doing what you're doing I hope. In this course we're going to cover the first five chapters of the book maybe not every section but most of them so uh, Probability, again, these are the basic concepts, axioms, and proofs, and simple proofs. Again, you may not always think that they're simple or basic because it may be the first time you're seeing them, in which case it can be uh, quite involved, which is why I'm encouraging you to keep up, take notes, and practice, uh, and do your homework, and all of those things that are going to help you uh, learn this and uh, absorb it effectively. All right. So, some basic concepts from STAT 222 that you're not required to have before you take this course. So most of you probably have, but that doesn't mean that all of you have. There are two basic types of studies, an observational study and an experimental design. 
observational study is exactly what it sounds like. We observe the process occurring and we don't interfere with it at all. And so we cannot prove cause or effect. This is the most common type of uh, study out there. And then we have the experimental design. And this is designed and, and the inputs are controlled. And if it's done well, when we get done, we can show cause and effect or not. Okay, Pro We can prove or disprove cause and effect only with an experimental design. And there is a class that will cover that. That's our STAT 400 class. Types of data. Two basic types of data. Qualitative, which is categorical data, and quantitative, where the numbers actually act as numbers or numerical. If it's categorical or qualitative data, we can have numbers like phone numbers or zip codes, but you can't add, subtract, divide, multiply, etc. Those numbers, they're not meaningful that way. They only identify uh, something like my phone, my cell phone, specifically has my cell phone number. That's all that number means. Okay, quantitative though. The values can be interpreted as numbers, like we would normally would. Discrete and continuous. Discrete are things that we can count. Okay? So you may think you can count all the numbers between 0 and 1, but there's actually a famous proof that says you cannot. Not only are there an infinite number of uh, values between 0 and 1, they are uncountable because we can keep on adding decimal places. No matter how many decimal places we have, we can keep adding decimal places. Discrete, uh, there are gaps. We can count it. There can be an infinite number of items that are discrete, but like people throughout all of history and the future, that would be infinite. We can count them. We can label them one, two, three, if we knew them all, uh, but uh, they're an infinite number, or it might be discrete. The uh, number of eggs laid by a hen in one week, that's going to be a discrete number. You can count them, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, or 7, usually. Okay, so <clears throat> levels of measurement. This is, uh, so for the qualitative data, we can use the nominal level of measurement, which is really just categorization. We put them into different categories, and then we usually count how many are in each category. Now, we can use, uh, for some uh, qualitative data, we can make it ordinal, put it in order, like small, medium, large, on sweatshirt sizes. But we don't know the difference between the two. We just know that small is smaller than large, and no one manufacturer is necessarily like the other manufacturer. Their measurements may be different. I've seen that quite a few times. I buy a large t-shirt from one manufacturer and it's skin tight and from another one and it hangs loose. So uh, anyway, so we can put them in order. Ranks are another thing. The best schools, uh, the order in which people uh, finish a race, uh, the rank within your graduating class in high school. But it doesn't tell how far apart each of you are. First and second may be a thousandth of a decimal place uh, of a letter of a, a number grade different, but there's the first place and the second place. The difference between the second and third could be uh, two points, you know, from a 99.9 .9, uh, average to a 97.9 .9 average. Interval. The distance between the values is meaningful, but we can't use ratios because there's not a real zero. The examples here are survey data. Because if I say uh, I'm taking a survey of how um, well an instructor uh, explained a topic, well, you might have from one to five, one being strongly disagree, fine, five being strongly agree that they were clear. What's zero? It really doesn't make any sense, does it, for there to be an absence of clarity, a complete absence. Might be close, but not a complete absence. So that's one example. The other common one is the um, temperature in Fahrenheit or Celsius. Because zero degrees Celsius or zero degrees Fahrenheit is not the absence of heat. But zero Kelvin is. But uh, temperature, as we normally talk about it, not as scientists, but as uh, lay people, Celsius, Fahrenheit, there is no absolute zero. So it doesn't make sense to say 70 degrees is twice as warm as 35 degrees. 
in either one of those because it's not. It's not. There's a difference of 35 degrees Fahrenheit or Celsius, whichever. That makes sense, but the ratio doesn't. So for a ratio to be meaningful, there has to be what we call a natural zero. The absence of what we're measuring has to be zero. So the height of a house. If you have zero height, there is no house. That's the absence of that height, right? And this throws students for a loop. They say, well, I, it, it's got to be interval because you can't have a house that's zero height. No, the way to look at it is, is zero the absence of what we're measuring? Yes, okay, then it's interval. Uh, then it's a ratio, I'm sorry. So most data is ratio because most of it has a natural zero, which is nice. Okay. So I'm not going to go over each of these terms, but I want you to write them down and put them in your notes because it is required for your lecture uh, notes that you take because this will help you remember them. So we're going to talk about random experiment and outcome, sample space, an event, null set or empty set, a subset, a union, an intersection, a complement, mutually exclusive events, mutually exhaustive events, and events that are both mutually exclusive and exhaustive. All right. So you can pause the video and write those down on your, on your notes that you're going to turn in to me. So let's understand this better by talking about an example. So I'm going to give you three examples quickly here. Random experiment. The first is that we're going to measure the surface finish from a manufacturing process where it polishes glass wafers. I actually worked in a place where that was one of the manufacturing processes. So the outcome of this random experiment is the result, the measured surface finish. So let's say we select an item, a wafer after polishing, and we measure it, and it has a surface finish of 5 angstroms, which is very, very fine, by the way. And that is equivalent to 0 0.5 nanometers, so small. Or um, and the sample space is the set of surface finishes, and those have to be greater than zero. They can't be equal to. We don't know how much greater they could be. Um, there is an upper limit. I just don't know what it is, and I don't want to guess, um, so I'm just saying greater than. All right. What about the number selected by the machine for the lottery, the Virginia Cash 5 lottery? So one of the outcomes may be from, uh, this is given from uh, 626 of 2020. So 13, 17, 26, 27, and 34. Notice they're put in order. That's how they publish them on their uh, website. So I can write the sample space is all of the sets of five numbers, assuming they're integers, uh, between 1 and 34 uh, in order. So that's why I've put this the less than uh, signs here. There's another way to write it, but uh, this is one easy way to write it. And then the number of miles before a tire goes flat. Say we take one and one tire out of this process and we follow it and it goes flat at 42,000 miles. We're not saying why. Could be a puncture, could have worn thin, who knows. And the sample space, let's say, would be between a zero and a million miles. So somebody could come along and puncture the tire before it even was uh, moved. Or uh, I've never seen a tire that lasted a million miles. So. I think I'm pretty safe in putting that as an upper limit. But if, you, if I'm wrong, let me know. I'm interested. All right. So here's an example. We're going to roll two die, a red one and a green one. They both have only four sides. So this is a weird looking die. The outcome is the number of dots facing up on each of the die. So our sample space S could be written as a set of uh, ordered pairs, one, 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 two, um, all the way up to 4-4. Four, four. And let's say that the first number represents the red die, the second number the green die. It, you could reverse it. It's fine. Just make sure that you specify it. So here's a table that is an easier way of writing our sample space. And I have all the possibilities. Green die, red die, the numbers 1 through 4, 1 through 4, and their ordered pairs. Let's define event A as the set of outcomes where the red die has at least two for its value, and B, where the sum of the two dies is at least three. If you look at this, this is B, 
at least three for a sum. And here's A. You'll notice that A is a subset of B. Here's B, here's A, here's B, here's A. So A is definitely inside or contained within B. Okay. So we can also notice that for each diagonal, the sum is the same for all of the values in the diagonal. So uh, the one that I have listed here, the sum is 3. The next is 4. The next is 5, 6, 7, 8, etc. So uh, the diagonals have the same values. This is handy to know for some of the problems. Now let's define A as what's circled there. The sum is equal to 3. I haven't written those out, but it'd be 2, 1, and 1, 2, or 1, 2, and 2, 1. B is So that's the first row. And I have written that out over here, where we have 1, 1, 1, 2, 1, 3, and 1, 4. The intersection of A and B is simply this value that's in both. So it's the set of 1, 2. Not 2, 1, but 1, 2. 2, 1 is outside of B, so it's not in the intersection. The union of A and B, or I'm sorry, the union of A with B, we don't want to say and. But remember that the union is or. So we don't want to use the word and. So I try to be careful and say A union with B is every item that's in B along with every item that's in A. And I don't repeat them. So 1, 2 is only in there once. And I've written them out here. The complement of B are all the values that are not in B. So it start with 2, 1, row 2, 3, and 4 here. Okay. Now let's redefine A as a red die has a value of 1. B, the red die has a value of at least 1, 1 or higher. So there's B. These are mutually exhaustive events because A union with B is equal to our sample space S, but they're not mutually exclusive. They're mutually exhaustive, but not mutually exclusive because the intersection uh, is not empty. In fact, A is contained within B. It's a subset. So now let's redefine B as the red die is 2 or higher, a value of 2, of high, two or higher. If we inter, uh, take the union of A and B, it's still equal to S, so it's mutually exhaustive. But notice that the, now the intersection, A and B, is empty, so they're also mutually exclusive. So mutually exclusive and mutually exhaustive sets A and B here. I hope that helps you understand these basic terms a lot better than going over the definition word for word. Please don't forget to scan your lecture notes by midnight tonight. Extra points for neatness? Okay, not really, but please do be neat. It, it does help for you more than me because you're the one that's going to have to use your notes, not me. Beginning with the next video, you'll want to start your formula sheet for the test. So that will help you uh, prepare for the test and get, keep these concepts uh, uh, fresh. And you want to pull out the things that are important so it will make it easy to do your homework and do the test problems. So until next time, please think about probability. Okay, I know most of you just rolled your eyes. But seriously, the more that you contemplate and think about this, the better you'll understand it, the easier this course will be. So until next time, please think about uh, what we've gone over. See you then.